title was the word towards it. Uh, because it means that the person isn't done yet. And that al almost always means that, uh, that there's some degree of, uh, uh, there's going to be some, some degree of um, uh, highly local confusion, which is the thing that we're the most excited about at the present, that they will maybe spend too much time talking about. But, um, Nonetheless, uh, um, uh, this is an object, the uh, dual amphitheatron, which in some sense uh, many of us have been looking for for longer even than the amphitheatron itself. Um, but uh, I'd like to tell you about uh, A, why we think it exists, uh, and B, um, uh, some, some uh, I think, at least breaks uh, some new thoughts about uh, how it might be uh, discovered. I should say this is all uh, work being done in various uh, various contexts, both Youngtown uh, as well as uh, St. Thomas uh, and Europe. Uh, okay. Um, but I think uh, before getting to this mysterious dual amphitheatron, uh, I want to put things in a little bit of context first and uh, at least tell you enough about the amphitheatron itself in order to make it clear what we understand, um, what we don't uh, understand, and why what we don't understand so clearly points to the existence of a dual object that will make everything make sense. Okay. Now, uh, the amphitheatron itself is, uh, is an example of um, a sort of answer uh, to the question for what underlies all the structure that's been seen in scattering amplitudes, especially in planar n equals 4 super angles. Uh, and the sort of answer that, uh, that, that many of us have been looking for uh, for a while, which is that, um, of course, we know Lagrangians, Kaplan and gauge redundancies and so on, uh, greatly complicate the structure of the final answer. Uh, we've known through incredible work by many people over many years that thinking in on-shell terms uh, has made it easier and easier to get to the final answer, uh, eschewing uh, all of the uh, extra uh, gauge redundant baggage. Um, but you can start wondering whether the amplitude is actually the answer to a very different kind of mathematical question. Uh, the amplitude is the answer to the question, what do, you, what do you get when you evolve a state from past infinity to future infinity uh, with uh, local unitary evolution? It makes, the, that's the standard picture of quantum field theory, it makes locality and unitarity totally obvious. Um, uh, but it makes it obvious at the, at the expense of all of these redundancies in our description that seem to make the answer so incredibly complicated. So it's natural to ask, is it possible to uh, think of the amplitude as the answer to a completely different kind of question? Um, and that question presumably lives in, in its own world. It doesn't live in so manifest, it doesn't live in space-time, doesn't live in Hilbert space. Uh, it lives in its own world, it has its own private rules, and if we understand those questions well, and we understand that, uh, how they're answered well, then we should be able to understand how locality and unitarity become derived features from uh, these more, more primitive ideas. So that's a very general philosophy that uh, you can try to pursue in thinking about scattering amplitudes, or in fact, any observables in a, in a quantum field theory. Scattering amplitudes are uh, just the sort of uh, richest ones from many points of view, and the most explored ones from many points of view, which is why they're, they're, they're perhaps the best place uh, to start thinking about things in this particular way. Um, so, so, so indeed, for planar n equals 4 super Yang mills, uh, uh, our current understanding of the amplitude is one such question. Instead of uh, thinking about, uh, instead of thinking about scattering amplitude by summing over finding diagrams, uh, you look at this geometric object that lives in its own space, space of k-planes and k plus four dimensions. You give me the external data. Uh, you give me the edge of the k and the HV amplitude that you want to consider. Uh, you associate this, sh this shape um, uh, in this auxiliary space. And then you 
have to tr cover the space. You have to triangulate it. You have to find a canonical form with logarithmic singularities on the boundary of the space. And that uh, gives you the amplitude. And nowhere is there any mention made of unitary evolution in space-time, but the geometry of the amplitudron. And here, geometry, uh, you shouldn't think of as like fancy geometry like a lot of the Gauss or something fancy. It here is almost logic. It has nothing, very little to do with distance or shape. It has, it's, it's almost, the, it's really almost the logic of positivity uh, that goes with, uh, in, the, uh, in the definition of the object uh, gives you uh, locality and unitarity as an output, not an input. Now, let me, uh, let me just give it uh, by way of uh, example, um, two concrete formulas which, uh, uh, which also serve to motivate uh, discovering this object. So um, we can express the NMHB tree amplitudes as a function of these momentum twisted variables that Mark talked about. And supersymmetrically, um, there are some uh, uh, Grassman variables that go along with them. Um, so just, just, to, uh, just to write it again, uh, there's an M Depends on lambda, lambda tilde, and uh, some other remaining variables, eta. And we can rewrite this as Mark showed. There's a simple algebraic relationship between the lambdas, lambda tildes, and something similar for these etas and the uh, eta tildes. We can write these as a function of uh, the variables z. So these were what he called the lambdas and the mu's. And these etas are four component Grassmann variables. Okay, so that's ultimately what, what we're after. But um, the NMHB tree amplitude uh, can be computed using BCFW recursion relations uh, and ends up being expressible in this form. Okay. The sum over uh, the, the particle indices i and j of this uh, R invariant uh, object that depends on five indices. And in general, one, two, three, four, five, just the, the few of you who haven't seen it probably, uh, is this very concrete expression. Okay. And all of these brackets downstairs are contractions with the uh, epsilon symbol. Okay, so it's a four dimensional epsilon symbol. All right, so this is a, a very concrete expression. What you get from out of BCFW and uh, a general comment is that all of the poles that would correspond to something like PI, the sum of PI up to PJ squared, all of these things go to zero. And those dual coordinates Mark talked about are like XI minus XJ squared goes to zero. And in the momentum twister language, this is like saying ZI is ZI plus one, ZJ is ZJ plus one. This four bracket goes to zero, ultimately saying that while i i plus one, j j plus one, generically in P3, i i plus one will be some line in three dimensions, j j plus one will be some other line in three dimensions. They don't generically intersect each other. If you're sitting on a factorization channel, these two lines uh, intersect each other. So those four points are coplanar, and, uh, and the way of saying that is that z i i plus one, z j, z j plus one goes to zero. So, uh, so this expression is just the five particle NMH amplitude. And indeed, every pole downstairs exactly looks like uh, 
uh, one of the usual uh, allowed faults of the form i i plus one j j plus one. But already when we go to the six particles, we see that every one of these terms, one of the uh, they all have five faults. One of them, the one involving i i plus one j j plus one, is a physical fault. But it typically has four other faults that are not physical faults. They are spurious faults, and they miraculously cancel uh, in the sum to give you something which uh, only has physical faults. And so that's one feature of the answer. Another feature of the answer is that even though the amplitude is cyclically invariant, because you shift all the z's over one, uh, uh, z's and a's all over one, you get the same answer. This expression is not manifestly cyclically invariant. There is a one sitting there. So if you replace the one by a two, you also get the same answer. But in this case, there's a very simple identity, uh, which explains why these things are uh, equal to each other. Um, but still, we, that, that's the sort of funny feature we have, is that uh, the answers are, while very simple, are expressive forms where individual pieces aren't local, the cyclic symmetries aren't obvious, and yet the final answer is, is indeed local and typically invariant. Okay, so that's one expression. Now, here's another expression for the MHB one loop amplitude, integrand now. And here, Mark showed us some examples for uh, four points and five points, but let me just write down in one go what they all end up being, okay? And um, first, what they all end up being, uh, um, so remember, Mark told you that you can think of this as this measure of d force dA, d force dB mod GL2 multiplied by some function of the line AB and the external uh, momentum pushers is dA. Um, I might explain a little later uh, just how to write this form a little bit more explicitly so you don't have to mod up by GL2. And here's the way you can write it. It's dA, dB, dZA, dDA. This is, these are all uh, epsilon together. So uh, because, because dC, because D gives you something anti-symmetric, that expression makes sense. So this is ZA, ZB, DCA, DCA, ZA, DB, DGD, DCB. And so that's uh, con concretely what that form is, times some function of A, B, and ZA. And here's what the function is. Okay? Um, and there's two representations. There are two representation shorts that I want to talk about. One of them is what you also get out of BCFW. And <coughs> these things are what make Yangian symmetry manifest and all sorts of other nice things. looking formula that has six folds downstairs. Nothing Mark showed you had more than four folds downstairs. This actually, but what comes out of BCFW has something that has six folds downstairs. Okay, once again, the, these are the physical ones. <coughs> ABII plus one, ABJJ plus one are physical. All the rest of them are spurious and all the rest of them magically cancel in the sum. Okay. Uh, by the way, this is one of those intersections that Mark was talking about. Uh, and for example, a concrete way of writing this, this is just a, one, a way of saying A, I, I plus one, B, J, B, one, J, J plus one, anti-symmetrize in A and B. Okay, so it's, that's the okay. That's one expression. That's what we get from BCFW that plays well with positivity, with the positive Rasmanian, and in a moment with the amplitudehedron. Here's another expression for it. Also the sum of i less than j. Very different looking. A, B, i bar intersect j. A, B, i minus one, i, i plus one intersect j minus one, j, j plus one. X, i, j. And x is any old object with two indices, like, like, like A, B. And here it's A, B, i minus one, i. This 
second expression, if you put x to be uh, a fixed line at infinity, the second expression are like the expressions Mark showed you. Okay? And you see there's five guys in the denominator, so this is in general a pentagon. And, but there's a numerator, and the job of the numerator, the job of the numerator, you see, is to put exactly a zero on the kind of leading singularity that Mark was showing you. Right? Remember, in the case of five points, Mark has the one nice leading singularity where AB was 1, 3, but then you have the other one where it was the intersection of two planes. See, that's exactly putting the intersection of two planes up there to put a zero there and kill that kind of uh, uh, leading singularity. All right, these are very different looking uh, expressions. This one has only local poles, other than this funny ABX. Okay? Um, all right, so they look, they look uh, quite different from each other. <coughs> but um, let me just give you one more clue um, uh, of there being some kind of uh, geometric structure underneath all of this. Um, uh, but the, the picture is, the picture was for a long time, and what the amplohedron then concretely realizes is the idea that the amplitudes are somehow the volume of something. There's a, there's a predefined region, and you're triangulating the region. And the reason why, uh, the reason why, for example, uh, this triangulation seems to create cyclic symmetry is that, well, that, you're, you're, you're familiar with that. If someone hands you a polygon, then any way of breaking it up into triangles is inevitably going to pick some points to be special, for example. Okay? Um, and it's also going to introduce boundaries which don't actually exist, that, that, that sort of cancel out uh, uh, in the sum. That's the, that's the analog of having these Fourier poles that cancel when you sum over everything. On, on the one hand. Uh, and there's even a little bit more that, that we'll see that was alluded to in some of the uh, previous talks, that, that the amplitude is expressed in a, uh, the amplitude is expressed uh, in a way that uh, can be written as a bunch of D logs, okay? Uh, that has logarithmic singularities. Now, um, just, th there's a little bit of asymmetry uh, for the NMHV, I've written down something that looks like a BCFW form, but there is another form that's the analog of the bottom one here, but I have not given you the language with which to express that one yet, so we'll say, uh, I might say something about it in a moment. But let me just come back to this, just in order to uh, uh, be a little bit more concrete about what logarithmic singular forms and logarithmic singularities and so on means. This looks like a kind of a crazy expression, um, but uh, you'll see there naturally seems to be the, the plane, one i i plus one, another plane, one j, j plus one. So let's do something. Let's expand z1, za, as z1 plus alpha zi plus beta zi plus one, and zb is the same z1 plus gamma zj plus rho zj plus one. Okay, I can always do this. This is just saying that any line ab, uh, it intersects the plane one i i plus one somewhere, it intersects uh, the plane 1jj plus 1 in B, and I'm just parameterizing where it intersects it uh, in 1i i plus 1, calling that ZA, where it intersects 1jj plus 1, calling it ZB. Okay, a small exercise for you is to shove that in. So you just have to literally shove it in ZA, ZB, 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 I've told you what ZA, ZB are, plug it into this awful seeming expression. And you'll see the job of this guy is to nicely cancel some crap downstairs. And that, in fact, this whole mess just becomes d alpha over alpha, d beta over beta, d gamma over gamma, d rho over rho. So what these things are doing, what these, uh, it's, not, it's not obvious ahead of time, but what the individual BCFW terms are, are things that make manifest that the answer is logarithmic singularity. It's hard to get more manifest than just being written clearly as a product of four d logs. Okay. And of course, you have to sum over, you have to sum, uh, but it isn't just one such term. You have to sum over many, many such terms that have uh, some of uh, uh, the logarithmic singularities. Okay, so, um, so, these, are, these were some of the clues in the structure of the answer that made it seem like we should associate, uh, we should try to find some region in some space 
and associate the amplitude with its volume. And that's what the amplidehedron is. So let me now just switch gears and just pretend we've never heard about any of these things. But sorry, but just one, there are many things in the amplidehedron. There are many things that such a geometry should do. One of them is it should make it clear why it is that when I have a bunch of external Zs, and no one tells you about space time or locality or anything like that, someone should tell you why it is that you care when i, i plus 1, j, j plus 1 goes to 0. Why is this special? Okay. You see, there are individual building blocks. These, those individual R invariants in the simplest case, they have all kinds of other poles. They don't care about this i, i plus 1, j, j plus 1 structure. It's locality that cares about i plus 1, j, j plus 1. So where does this funny structure come from? What, what takes democratic Zs and makes you care about these funny combinations where they're, where they're paired up? So that's a, one qualitative question. Another qualitative thing, you know that when you sit on a factorization channel, when you sit on one of these i plus 1, j, j plus 1, well, you're supposed to factorize it. So again, this, this, this is what this is what the picture of gluons propagating in space-time makes manifest, right? But there's got to be, whatever the structure is, it's got to tell you about things like this and their analog at loop level. It has to come out out, out of its uh, internal logic, whatever it is. Okay, so now let's forget all about the physics and let me just uh, define the amplitude in itself. So everything in this story uh, begins with a uh, begins by thinking about a triangle for a while, and then uh, uh, generalizing the notion of a triangle in a plane in uh, different ways. So let's say you have a triangle, and uh, just to be really concrete, imagine that its vertices are z1, z2, z3. Okay, and uh, what I want to do is describe all the points on the inside of the triangle. Well, one way of describing all the points on the inside of the triangle is to say that the, is to imagine these vertices have masses C1, C2, and C3. I'm not calling them M's for historical reasons. And then to say that, uh, that if I take all such points, okay, then all such points are for all possible values of C1, C2, C3 will sweep out the inside of the triangle. Okay. So that's the center of mass idea. You sweep out the uh, you sweep out the inside of the triangle. Now every time in geometry you do anything where the notion of distance or angle doesn't make an appearance, it's always more convenient and more powerful to think in terms of projective geometry. So in this case, uh, uh, instead of thinking about two-dimensional vectors, we're going to imagine external data are three-dimensional. Okay, so there is some there is some top component z zero, and then a z in the bottom here. Okay. But that I can rescale. I can identify z with t z separately for each guy. Okay. So if I do that, I can always rescale the top component to be one. And then this formula becomes much simpler, because I also have the same thing for y. And this formula becomes yi is just c1 z1 plus c2 z2 plus c3 z3. Okay. Does everyone see what that is? Because now, if you just write it out, the top component of y becomes c1 plus c2 plus c3. And then if I decide to projectivize so that the top component of, of, of everybody is 1, then I'll get the over C1 plus C2 plus C3 down there. Okay? But this is, a, this is a nicer and more uh, symmetrical way of writing. Okay? Where, again, very importantly, all the Cs are positive. All these Cas are, are positive. Okay? So that's the notion of an inside of the triangle. And we can generalize that to the inside of a simplex. So if I hand you a C1, Cn. So here I have a C1, C2, C3. Of course, I can rescale them all by the same constant multiple, um, but I declare that all the Cs are positive. Now, what I 
When I mean they're all positive, I mean they're either all positive or all negative. All the ratios are positive. Okay? But from now on, I'll just say that they're all positive so I don't keep having to write that over and over again. Okay, so now we can have C1 through Cn mod Gl1. Again, with all the CAs positive, that's just a simplex, a tetrahedron in three dimensions, and so on. Okay. This is totally trivial notion. But the first interesting generalization of this is to, uh, to, the, to the positive Grassmannian. So that's the first, the first generalization is to lift the inside of the triangle into the Grassmannian, and that becomes the positive Grassmannian. So what is that here? Well, another way of thinking about C1 to Cn on GL1 is it's just a line, a ray, that passes through the origin. So if I just have the space of rays passing through the origin, that's a space of one planes, lines in n dimensions. On top of that, I put some positivity requirements on. So now I'm going to generalize to the space of k planes passing through an origin. K planes passing through an origin, I can think of as being k n dimensional vectors. Sorry, n k dimensional vectors. k-dimensional vectors, I can assemble into a k by n matrix. I can think of the top row as being a ray, the next row as being a ray, and so on. So this collection of rays, k rays, spans a k-plane that passes through the origin. And so if I do any k by k linear transformations on the left, I'm not changing anything about the plane. So I need to be monitoring this out by glk that acts uh, that, that, that acts by mixing the rows together. But now the question is, what's the analog of saying that all the Cs are positive? I can't say that all the entries of this matrix are positive because I can change that by doing GLK transformations. The only GLK invariants that I can talk about are determinants made up out of columns of this matrix. So these are minors in the matrix, CA1 through CAK. And so I can say that all the minors are positive. That's the most obvious. Uh, generalization. Except that here, uh, I need to do something I didn't need to do there, which is to define an ordering for the columns. Okay? I have to order the columns, because the minors are in general anti-symmetric, these determinants are anti-symmetric. So I have to say that these are zero when the columns are ordered. Okay, so now, so that, that's it. So we've defined the positive Grassmannian in one line. It's the space of k by n matrices mod glk, where all the ordered minors are positive. But this is a much, much richer space than a simplex. And let's just pause to visualize what it looks like. And to do it, I'm going to jump to visualizing the positive g3n. So imagine that I have a 3 by n matrix. You'll see why this will save me some time in a second. So I have three-dimensional vectors, C1 through Cn. And suppose, just for fun, that the top component of all these Cs were positive. So that means that just by rescaling the columns by positive numbers, I can bring them to the form 1, let me call it x1, 1, xn. These are little two-dimensional vectors. Okay. So, uh, so, I, so if I hand you a bunch of random points, on the plane, 